Yesterday, I made a video called Mars has a lot more water than we thought. In that video, I talked about the new layer of wet rocks found below the Martian crust that has more water stored within it than Mars has ever had in its now-gone oceans. At the end of the video, I said that finding something like this on other worlds like the moon would be extremely beneficial for colonization. I've covered extensively why colonizing the moon is an extremely good idea. Colonizing the moon will be profitable, will bring real benefits to the average person, help save Earth itself, and propel humanity to an interplanetary future. The moon is a lot more than a stepping stone, it's the entire highway to the stars. I won't cover that in this video, but all you need to know for this is that colonizing the moon is an objectively good idea no matter how you look at it, and I have an entire playlist on my channel about why. Also check out one of my favorite channels, Anthrofuturism, that goes extremely in-depth about colonizing the moon, which I'll link in a pinned comment. But the main drawback the moon has is that it barely has any water. The total water content on the entire moon has been hotly debated, but estimates have ranged from all the way down to a small lake's worth on the South Pole. Across the entire lunar South Pole, in all the ice-filled craters and potentially underground aquifers, millions and millions of square miles of land, one small lake. This, obviously, is a big problem. One small lake, even with the water recycling technology we currently use on the International Space Station or Tiangong, isn't going to be enough for a large population. If we want to colonize the moon, which we absolutely want to, we're going to need a better way to get water. Importing it from Earth is too expensive and the opposite of what we want to use the moon for, eliminate the need for Earth to launch rockets. And we might have just found a way. And, counterintuitively, the way to do it is to heat dirt to thousands of degrees. Based on samples of the moon we've gotten from both the crewed Apollo moon landings and sample return missions from China, we know that the moon's soil is made from anywhere from 0.02% to 0.0001% water. This means that in one ton of lunar regoliths, over 2,200 pounds, there's at most maybe one pound of water. That's nowhere near enough for just one person, and if we want to get water by mining regoliths, we need to be clearing thousands and thousands of tons every day just to support a population. The Chang'e 5 mission was China's first lunar sample return. Once the Chang'e 5 samples returned to Earth, we quickly began analyzing them. Because of this and other samples, we know that the lunar regolith has all the ingredients to make water. Lunar regolith is essentially half oxygen. There's so much oxygen on the moon, we literally could not find a purpose for all of it if we tried. Saying there's more than enough oxygen on the moon to breathe is a massive understatement. As well as this, the moon has no atmosphere or magnetic field, meaning 100% of the solar wind that reaches the moon reaches its surface. This means there's tons of hydrogen all over the moon. A type of rock on the moon called ilmenite was found to contain the most. Hydrogen and oxygen make water. Water might not be there, but the ingredients for it are. All we need to do is make it. And that's exactly what scientists working on the Chang'e 5 samples did. They used concave mirrors to heat up the lunar samples to over 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit, or 920 Celsius. When they did this, they found that one gram of lunar soil can create between 50 and 70 milligrams of water. In other words, one ton of lunar regolith should be able to produce about 100 water bottles worth of water, enough to keep 50 people alive for a day. This is huge, and at least in my opinion, far more important than the water discovery on Mars only a few weeks ago. The biggest challenge of colonizing the moon is not getting there, we already know how to do that. It's figuring out how we're going to survive down there. So far, the best ideas have been to mine ice in the permanently shadowed craters on the South Pole, something that's going to take a lot of infrastructure and be very difficult, making the founding of a lunar colony much more difficult. With this discovery, we might not even need to do that. We just need to melt a bunch of regolith, and all of a sudden, we have more than enough water to support a large crew, crops, produce rocket fuel, and so much more. We won't need tankers of water constantly running between Earth and the Moon. We won't need hundreds of launches from Earth just to supply the colony's water needs. We can get everything we need from the rocks. This is already combined with the fact that melting lunar regolith produces oxygen. As I already said, the Moon is practically made of oxygen. Oxygen is found in almost every single rock on the Moon, and to free it, all we need to do is melt the rock. That's something we'll already need to do if we need to make steel or concrete or aluminum, so a lunar colony would have much more oxygen than it knew what to do with. Now we can do the exact same with water. Of course, a lot of infrastructure is still going to be needed. We're going to need machines capable of heating tons and tons of regolith to thousands of degrees. This also doesn't affect the other problems with colonizing the moon, like the dust, radiation, or how we're going to build the habitats, but it's a major leap forward nonetheless. If one ton of regolith can make water for 50 people in one day, then it could also support one person for 50 days, or two people for 25. The International Space Station usually has a crew of seven. With just one ton, a thousand or so kilograms of lunar soil, we could support an ISS-sized crew on the moon for a week. 
And as long as we can melt about a thousand kilograms of rock a week, we can keep the colony going indefinitely, at least as far as water is concerned. That number is also assuming we don't recycle water. The ISS and Tiangong both recycle the vast majority of their water, reusing it over and over. So, imagine we can support 50 people one day, 49 the next, then 48, and so on. And even that's conservative. We don't need to mine a thousand kilograms a day. We only need a few just to replace the small losses we get from recycling. Of course, we're not yet at the point where we can melt even one kilogram of regolith using machines on the moon, let alone a thousand. But there are people trying to change that. China's Chang'e 8 mission, set to launch in 2028, will attempt an experiment to produce bricks on the moon, made of material on the moon. This is China's last planned Chang'e mission, because after that, construction of the ILRS will begin. The ILRS, if you're not aware, stands for the International Lunar Research Station. As sci-fi as it sounds, China actually has extremely detailed plans for the construction of the ILRS, which, if all goes according to plan, could very well be the first permanent base on the moon. I believe it definitely will happen. China runs its space program very differently than NASA. They keep many missions secret, and don't even announce the crew of missions until after they've already launched. China only announces missions they're confident will be successful. So, if China is making their plans for ILRS public, then that's not simply propaganda. It means they actually believe they can do it. And with how well their space station, Tiangong, has been doing, as well as their successful Chang'e robotic moon landings, it's extremely possible, even likely, that the ILRS will get built in the 2030s. NASA, on the other hand, currently has no finalized plans to build a moon base. We have concepts, but not plans. Also, despite what you may think, we very much do have the technology to achieve this. I have an upcoming video about how we could colonize the moon right now with modern day technology and how we could have started six years ago, but that's a topic for later. All you need to know is that both China and the United States are preparing to build moon bases, and this new discovery will make it exponentially easier. As well as this, it also might eliminate competition. Currently, the best place to build a moon base is Shackleton Crater on the lunar south pole. It's filled with water ice we can mine, and because of the moon's low axial tilt, the crater rim receives constant sunlight, perfect for solar power stations. Unfortunately, Shackleton Crater is only 20 kilometers wide. It has very limited resources, which could open up the possibility for competition or conflict between the US and China over it. You could imagine a scenario where the US and China disagree about mining rights in the crater, leading to disputes. But if we don't need to harvest ice from Shackleton or any other ice-filled crater, this won't happen. You could get water from pretty much anywhere, as long as there's available hydrogen, which the moon does have. Which is also good for another reason. I also plan to make a video soon about the best places to build a moon base. I have a lot of videos about colonizing the moon in the works, so definitely stay tuned for those, but for yet another short version, the lunar maria, or the dark spots, have a lot more abundant valuable materials. The south pole does not. It's rich in water, but poor in iron, titanium, aluminum, and every other metal we could possibly want. The maria have it a lot better. But with old ideas of getting water on the moon, we were confined to the south pole, because that's where the water is. But not anymore. If we can make water from the rocks, then we're free to build a moon colony anywhere we want. In the iron-rich fields of Oceanus Prosolarum, or the titanium-rich Mare Tranquillitatis, or just anywhere we want. All of a sudden, the entire moon is opened up to its fullest extent, just waiting for us to arrive. All in all, this new discovery, if used to its full potential, will change everything about lunar colonization. We might not be bound to the South Pole, and we might not need to compete over scarce resources, and the difficulties of making a self-sustaining moon colony will be lessened greatly. I plan to make a lot more videos about colonizing the moon in the near future. Stay tuned for videos like a tour of the lunar South Pole, we could colonize the moon now, where to build a moon base, and several more in the coming weeks. Also check out my other videos about colonizing the moon I've already made. And check out Anthrofuturism, the best channel I've seen about colonizing the moon. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, check out my other videos about colonizing the moon.